In a previous video, we calculated the radius of our planet. But the value that we calculated was, technically, the planet's volumetric radius. If you're just building a quick planet, then this is definitely the radius value you need, as it is the radius value that is most commonly used to calculate parameters like the planet's surface gravity, mean density, and escape velocity. But if you're building a detailed planet, then the volumetric radius alone is not going to provide the most accurate description of your planet's shape. The volumetric radius is defined as the radius of a perfect sphere with the same volume as the planet we're building. But as you are probably aware, planets are not perfect spheres, but rather a shape known as an oblate spheroid. This is because as a planet rotates, it generates a centrifugal force, which causes its equator to bulge outward and its poles to draw inward. This gives it two additional radius values, an equatorial radius and a polar radius. The amount that these two radii differ by is referred to as the planet's ellipticity or its oblateness, or its flattening. For our purposes, all of these words refer to the same thing. We'll use flattening since it's the easiest to say and spell. To work out what this flattening value is, we first need to determine our planet's rotation period. This is where a lot of world builders make a small mistake. It's a common misconception that we define a day as the length of time it takes a planet to make one full rotation. But this isn't quite accurate. It conflates the two rotation periods that planets possess, the synodic period and the sidereal period. The sidereal rotation period is the amount of time it takes for a planet to rotate 360 degrees, while the synodic rotation period is what defines the length of a day and is the time it takes for a longitude of the planet, what we call its prime meridian, to make a full rotation and come back around to face the star. The reason these two periods are not the same is because in the time it takes a planet to rotate 360 degrees, it has moved some distance along in its orbit, so it has to rotate beyond 360 degrees to face the star once again. Unless your planet is tidally locked, it's up to you to define what you want your planet's synodic rotation period to be, that is, the length of its day. To that end, I only offer this advice. Whereas a planet's rotation period can be very long, it should not be infinite. That is, its rotational velocity shouldn't be zero. On the other end of the scale, it shouldn't have a rotation period shorter than six hours, as below this period, the physics starts getting complicated. Also bear in mind that planets with long rotation periods tend to have significantly hotter climates. And lastly, I would refrain from making the length of your planet's day equally divisible by hours. It is very unlikely that an exoplanet would match up to this unit of time that we humans have defined, and using only hours to represent this period makes it look like you've put very little thought into your planet's creation, which is obviously not the case. So in addition to the number of hours you come up with, throw on a few extra minutes and seconds. For my planet, I'm going to set its synodic rotation period at 31 hours, 17 minutes, and 41 seconds. Before we move on, I need to convert this period into seconds. I can do this by multiplying the number of hours by 3600, which is the number of seconds in an hour, then adding that to the number of minutes multiplied by 60, the number of seconds in a minute, and finally adding that to the number of seconds. This gives me a value of 112,661 seconds, which I'm going to record on my SAP sheet. Now we can calculate our planet's sidereal rotation period, which is what we'll need for our flattening calculation. To do this, we'll use this equation, which relates the sidereal period to the synodic period, the length of our planet's day, minus the quotient of the synodic period squared divided by the orbital period, or the length of our planet's year. So on the calculator, I enter my planet's synodic rotation period in seconds, that's 112,661. Then I click minus, open parentheses, enter the synodic period again, but square it by raising it to the power of two, then divide by my planet's orbital period, which we calculated in a previous video as 
359,703.4648. Then we close the parentheses and our equation should look something like this. We press equals and get our sidereal rotation period in seconds. Mine is 112,179 seconds. So I'll add this to my SAP sheet before we convert it to the more understandable hours, minutes, seconds format. We start by converting it into hours by dividing our period by 3600, the number of seconds in an hour. That gives me a value of 31.1608 blah 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 hours. So I'm going to write down 31 hours, then I'm going to subtract 31 from my result so that I'm left with only the digits to the right of the decimal point. Then I'm going to multiply this by 60, the number of minutes in an hour. So when I press equals, I get a bit over 9 minutes. Once again, I'm going to subtract the integer, in this case 9, from the result to leave only what's after the decimal point. Then I'm going to multiply the remainder by 60, the number of seconds in a minute. This will give me the number of seconds, which for me is 39. So that gives me 31 hours, 9 minutes, and 39 seconds. Now with the planet's rotation squared away, we can look into calculating how much that rotation flattens out our planet. The way in which a planet reacts to centrifugal forces is determined by its interior configuration. Terrestrial planets have very complex differentiated interiors with a crust, mantle, outer core, and inner core, among other possible features. Each of these layers has its own unique composition and ratio of elements that vary in density. Even within these layers, there can be density variations based on temperature and depth. And the higher a material's density, the more resistant it is to deformation, generally speaking. So, as you can imagine, accurately calculating how a complex object such as this deforms under a force is extremely complicated. That's why, when astrophysicists are considering the flattening of exoplanets, they tend to use an approximation, such as the one currently on screen. It approximates a planet's flattening by ignoring all of that internal complexity and assuming the planet to be a solid object of uniform density throughout. Though not realistic, it's usually accurate enough for most applications. However, I'm going to have us tack on an additional, admittedly unscientific, term onto the end of the equation that will, hopefully, nudge it a bit closer to a realistic value. But I'll talk more about that in a bit. For now, let's calculate our approximate value. To start with, let's make this equation a bit simpler by just entering 15 pi and dividing it by 4. Then press equals and you should get this number. Now we're going to multiply this by 1 divided by, open a parentheses and enter our planet's sidereal rotation period, then square it by raising it to the power of 2. Then we'll multiply that by our planet's mean density. And finally, we'll multiply that by the gravitational constant. So open parentheses and enter 6.6743 times 10 to the power of negative 11. Then close both parentheses. Your equation should look something like this. Pressing equals, we get this approximate value for our flattening which is close, but not quite as accurate as we want it to be. We know it's not quite accurate because we can put the values for Earth's sidereal rotation period and mean density into this equation and see how the results differ from Earth's measured flattening value. Doing this, we find that it is off by a factor of about 0.7776. So by multiplying the value that I got from the equation by this factor, it will, theoretically, make my planet's flattening much more consistent with what would be expected of one with an internal complexity similar to that of Earth. So if you're building an Earth-like terrestrial, I would suggest multiplying the value you get from this equation by 0.7776 or a number close to it. But if you're building a subterrestrial with a mean density close to 4,000 kilograms per cubic meter, then you should instead use a value close to 1.0322. But once we have our flattening value, let's add it to our SAP sheet. You should get at least four digits past the decimal point. Six is better and eight is best. 
I'm going to record my flattening value as 0.00215215. Now we can calculate our planet's equatorial and polar radii. We're going to start with the polar radius, which we can find using this equation, which relates the polar radius to the volumetric radius, which we calculated in a previous video, to 1 minus 2 thirds the flattening value. So we start by entering our planet's volumetric radius. For me, that's 6,804,985 meters. Then we multiply in open parentheses. Type 1 minus 2 divided by 3 times our flattening value. For me, that's 0 0.00215215. Close the parentheses and our equation should look something like this. Pressing equals, I get a value for my planet's polar radius of 6,795,221 meters. So I'll add that to my SAP sheet. Now we can calculate our planet's equatorial radius using this equation, which relates the square of the equatorial radius to the cube of the volumetric radius divided by the polar radius. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that was confusing, but it's not as bad as it sounds. Let's start by opening parentheses and entering our planet's volumetric radius. This is the first radius that we defined several videos back. For me, that's 6,804,985 meters. Then raise it to the power of 3. Then we're going to divide it by its polar radius, which is what we just calculated. For me, that's 6,795,221 meters. Close the parentheses and raise it to the power of 1 over 2. So your equation should look something like this. Pressing equals, we get our planet's equatorial radius, which I'm going to add to my SAP sheet as 6,809,872 meters. If you've made it this far, congratulations. You now have an accurately shaped planet. That covers all of the important parameters that we're going to cover in this video, but there are a number of optional parameters that we can grab if we want them. The first is the planet's surface area, which we can calculate using this equation, which relates the surface area to 4 pi times the planet's polar radius times its equatorial radius. This is a very straightforward equation to put into the calculator. We don't need any parentheses or anything. Just 4 pi times our polar radius, for me that's 6,795,221, times our equatorial radius, which for me is 6,809,872. Press equals and there's our planet's surface area, which I'm going to record to my SAP sheet as 5.8150 times 10 to the power of 14 square meters. Next, we can calculate our planet's spherical volume using this equation, which relates the volume to the surface area that we just calculated times the equatorial radius of our planet divided by 3. So with our calculated surface area still on the screen, let's press multiply and enter our planet's equatorial radius. Then we'll divide by 3. Your equation should look something like this. Press equals and there's our planet's volume, which I'm going to record to my SAP sheet as 1.3199 times 10 to the 21 cubic meters. Next, we can get the rotational velocity of our planet using this equation, which relates the velocity to the planet's equatorial circumference, given here as 2 pi times the planet's equatorial radius, divided by its sidereal rotation period. So that's open parentheses, 2 pi, times 6,809,872 meters, close parentheses, and divide by the planet's sidereal rotation period, which for me is 112,179 seconds. Press equals and there's our planet's rotational velocity in meters per second. So I'll add that to my SAP sheet as 381.4 meters per second. And lastly, we can calculate the planet's rate of rotation by either entering 360 degrees and dividing it by the planet's sidereal rotation period to get the rate in degrees per second, or we can enter 2 pi and divide it by the period to get the rate in radians per second. Your choice. 
If you've made it this far, congratulations. You now have the vast majority of your planet's bulk parameters accurately defined. In my next video, we'll start fleshing out the details of our planet's orbital parameters. I hope you will join me for that.